my pain This is the air I breathe Your holy presence Living in me This is my daily bread This is my daily bread Your very word Spoken to me And I This is the air I breathe This is the air I breathe Your holy presence Living in me This is my daily bread This is my daily bread Your very word spoken to me And I again. Psalm 63, verse 1 says, God, you are my God, and I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you, God. My body faints for you in a land that is dry, desolate, and without water. Let's sing that chorus again.
I'm lost without you. Father God, it is true that we are desperate for you. And God, if we don't feel like we are, then I pray that you will make us feel that way. Because you truly are the God who brings refreshment in the wilderness. You caused water to pour out of a rock when the Israelites were traveling through that desert. And your scriptures tell us over and over again that you bring refreshment to those who are weary. I think about the scripture in Ezekiel where it talks about that stream that starts in the temple and then flows out from there down into the Jordan River and eventually into the, the Dead Sea, which makes that water fresh. God, that is the powerful God that we serve. So God, we are so thankful that we can rely on you that we can drink from that living water that Jesus talks about to the woman in Samaria. So we can drink from that water and never be thirsty again. So God, make us desperate for you today, God. Make us desperate. Father, we love you so much. We are so thankful for who you are, for the way that you display your power in our lives. I was reminded this week and reading in Genesis 16 that you are the God who sees. And so, God, you see everything that's going on in our lives, the good and the bad. And I know, God, that that comes as a reminder to us to, to really keep us in check. When we step out of that alignment with your will, we need to know that you see that, and that's displeasing to you. We also take encouragement in that, knowing that, that you see where we are and the struggles that we are experiencing in our lives. You see it, God. You care about that. And we know that everything that we have, our hope, we find in you, Jesus. We don't find hope in this world. We don't find security in this world. We find our security and our hope in you, Jesus Christ. You are our rock. You are our salvation. You are our Lord. You are our provider. And we trust you, God, to provide for everything we need. So awaken us today, God, to the reality of those truths. Lord, we want to lift up some things in our lives today. We want to pray for comfort for Joe and Kim Farrow and the death of Joe's dad last week. Will you just surround them, Father, with comfort? Let them know how much you love them. Father, we also want to ask the same for comfort for the family of Lynn Golden who died just a couple of days ago. Lord, will you minister to her family? May her faith be a wonderful encouragement and example to them. We also pray for Anita Tate Weidenhammer, who is such a dear friend of Lynn's. Lord, meet her in her need as well. Bring comfort, bring healing to their hearts. Father, we think about Brenda Hunsaker, who has severe pneumonia, and just struggling. We ask, God, that you will enter into that struggle with her. Lord, we thank you for her faith that is strong. We thank you that she loves you more than anything else in this world. But, Father, she needs a miracle. She needs your hand of blessing to be upon her. So we pray for healing, Lord. Pray for her family as they seek you and your will. Father, we also want to lift up Cheryl Brunsting, who's recovering from shoulder surgery this week. We pray that her pain will be low. We pray that the healing will be swift. We pray for Rod, who ministers to her regularly on a daily basis. God, we just lift her to your throne right now and ask you to surround her with your comfort and with your grace. Father, we also want to think about Paul Paul Mattern, who goes in for back surgery on Tuesday, and for our brother Rick Rankin going in for surgery on his heart on Friday. Lord, you know what needs to be done. We pray for expertise and excellence for the physicians and the medical staff who will be attending to their needs in these surgeries. We ask God that you will make these men a blessing to that staff. May their joy 
just bubble up inside of them, even as they face these surgeries. May the joy of the Lord lead them as they minister to the people who will be serving them. Father, we also think about our health care workers and our essential workers who are out in the public daily, constantly. Lord, we ask that you protect them from any physical harm, any spiritual attacks. We pray against depression. We pray against disappointment. We pray against bad health. God, we just lift them to you and ask you to work mightily in their lives. Father, and for our leadership and our staff, as we contemplate what it looks like to reopen our church campus. Lord, we need your wisdom. We need your discernment as we decide certain things. God, we want to be on the same page that you are on. So Lord, we just pray for your Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us in these decisions that will be pleasing to you. Lord, we do pray for our governmental leaders right now, too, who are faced with this huge issue of what to do. God, we just ask that you will whisper in their ears, that they will hear your voice. God, I pray for the church to rise up in this time. Lord, as we said earlier, the church hasn't stopped meeting just on the campus. The church is alive. The church is well. You are the head of our church, Jesus Christ, and we look to you to be your hands and to be your feet, to be your voice. So lead us, Father. Jesus, Holy Spirit, we need you. Lord, we are so desperate to hear from your word today and from what you've prepared through your servant, Pastor Mike. So God, I pray that your anointing will just be upon him today, that you will fill our living rooms, our computer screens, our offices, wherever we might be listening today and viewing. Whether that's in this country or around the world, God, may your anointing fall everywhere. May we be encouraged. May we be excited to hear from your word. You are mighty. You are holy. You are just. You are our Father, our Savior, our guide, and we love you. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's turn our hearts to the reading of God's Word today. We'll be reading from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, verses 50 through 54. Then Jesus shouted out again, and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. The Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. And they said, This man truly was the Son of God. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you, Tim, so much for reading God's word for us. We are uh, excited to dive into God's Word this morning. And uh, if you are joining us live right now, you've uh, probably experienced some technical difficulties. Um, We apologize for that, um, and we would covet your prayers. We know that, um, you know, uh, the the enemy would do whatever possible to destroy the... um, the opportunity of God's people to worship. And so we just pray that God would continue to work and move and that he would speak uh, through the rest of this time. Uh, And as we open God's word, let's pray together and ask him to speak. Lord God, we are, we're so thankful for your word and for your willingness as the creator of the universe, holy, almighty, all all, uh, all present God, you are willing to reach into our lives to reveal yourself. You've revealed yourself to us through your word. And, and this morning as we open it and look at how you've expressed to us your desire for us to worship you. Um, as you've given us this incredible picture of what worship in heaven will be like. God, I pray that you would open our eyes and that you would open our hearts. So by the power of your spirit, would you just pierce our ears and pierce our hearts right now? 
God, I want to surrender myself that you would be able to speak through me. God, um, use my voice for your honor and glory, glory, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So it was in uh, 1981, I was nine years old, when um, Steven Spielberg released the first movie in the Indiana Jones trilogy. And I, I remember watching for the first time Indiana Jones um, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And if you saw that movie, it was all about um, it was all about Indiana Jones picking up the quest of his father to find the Ark of the Covenant. And he follows the clues and there's adventure and there's, um, there's, there's action and there's drama. There's all this stuff. And finally they find the Ark of the Covenant, but it's, it's stolen by the Nazis. And there's a scene towards the end of the movie where Indiana Jones and the heroine of the movie are, are tied to this pole and the Nazis are going to open the Ark of the Covenant. It's sitting uh, in front of this large crowd of Nazi um, soldiers and, uh, and some important people and, and they, they uh, lift off the cover of the Ark of the Covenant and there's this release of, uh, of powerful spirits and they fly all over the place and it ends up um, at the end of that with the, the Nazis all just being destroyed. They're just seeing that event happening, the, the opening of the Ark of the Covenant. They're, they're killed uh, immediately and, and some of the scene shows the people's, uh, the soldiers' faces melting off. But the whole time, um, the whole time this is happening, Indiana Jones, as he's strapped there to the pole, says to the heroine of the, of the movie, don't look, keep your eyes closed, don't look. And while this is a, a product of Steven Spielberg's imagination, there's, there's some revelation of truth there in what the Ark of the Covenant was. We've been walking through this series uh, looking at the tabernacle. Um, and we, this morning, we arrive, we arrive to the Holy of Holies, to the Ark of the Covenant. We've come through the gate, through the person of Jesus. We've recognized on the bronze altar the sacrifice Jesus made for us, how we are washed in the Word. We entered into the holy place, and we talked about the table of showbread representing Jesus, and the... the um, the golden lampstand, which represent, re, represented the Holy Spirit. Last week, we talked about that altar of incense, which was really about our praise and our prayers being lifted to the Father. And today, we enter into that Holy of Holies, which housed the Ark of the Covenant. So what is the Ark of the Covenant? Why so significant? Why would Steven Spielberg dream up this, um, this, this piece of furniture which was taken out of uh, the tabernacle having such power? Well, first, I want to look at uh, the book of Exodus where um, Moses describes uh, the ark. And these words came from God. Uh, God said to Moses, Have the people make an ark of acacia wood, a sacred chest, 45 inches long, 27 inches wide, and 27 inches high. Overlay it inside and out with pure gold. And run a molding of gold all around it. Cast four gold rings and attach them to its feet and two gold rings on each side. Make poles from acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings at the sides of the ark to carry it. These carrying poles must stay inside the rings. Never remove them. They never wanted to remove them because um, nobody was allowed to touch the Ark of the Covenant. So once the rings were in there, or the poles were in the rings, they always needed to be there. When the Ark is finished, place, it in, place inside it the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant which I will give you. So we know that uh, according to God, he wanted the tablets of stone that, that contained the Ten Commandments to be placed inside of the ark. Then make the ark's cover a place of atonement from pure gold. It must be 45 inches long and 27 inches wide. So it's the same dimensions of the ark. So this place of atonement, this cover is the exact size of the ark. Then make two cherubim from hammered gold 
and place them on the two ends of the Ark of the, Co- Ark of the Atonement cover. Mold the cherubim on each end of the atonement cover, making it all one piece of gold. The cherubim will face each other and look down on the atonement cover with their wings spread above it, and they will protect it. Place inside the ark the stone tablet inscribed with the terms of the covenant which I will give to you, and then put the atonement cover on top of the ark. These are important words. God says to Moses, I will meet with you there and talk to you from above the atonement cover, between the gold cherubim that hover over the Ark of the Covenant. From there, I will give you my commands for the people of Israel. So we have this Ark of the Covenant, this chest that was built. It's overlaid in gold with these poles in it that are overlaid in gold as well. And on top of it, you have these two uh, angels, these cherubims that are molded. Um, artist uh, rendition of it looks something like this. And, uh, and it looks like, you know, these two wings coming and they're spanning over and they're connecting uh, above that. And that was, that was known as the place of atonement. It was the place where Moses would go to meet with God. And so we understand that the Ark of the Covenant is a representation of the presence of God, the commands of God which were placed inside, the place where sins were atoned for. This was where God existed. When Moses wanted to talk to God, this is where he would go. He would would speak to God and meet with God at the Ark of the Covenant. The book of Hebrews describes a little bit more the Ark of the Covenant. In in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 to 8, says this, that first covenant between God and Israel, that would be the Ten Commandments, that was what was placed in the Ark, uh, had regulations for worship and a place of worship here on earth. There were two rooms in that tabernacle. In the first room were the lampstand, the table, and the sacred loaves of bread on that table. We know about that. We've learned about that. This room was called the holy place. There was a curtain. And behind that curtain was a second room called the most holy place. In that room were were a gold incense altar and a wooden chest called the Ark of the Covenant which was covered with gold on all sides. And inside the ark were a gold jar containing manna, Aaron's staff that sprouted leaves, and the stone tablets uh, of the covenant. Above the ark were cherubim of divine glory. Recognize it says divine glory. It's a picture of godliness, the presence of God, whose wings stretched out over the ark's cover, the place of atonement. But we cannot explain these things in detail now. When these things were all in place, the priest regularly entered the first room as they performed their religious duties. But only the high priest ever entered the most holy place, and only once a year. He always offered blood from him for his own sins and for the sins of the people, the ones they had committed in ignorance. By these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and its system, uh, the system it represented, were still in use. And so you have uh, the author of Hebrews describing this uh, most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant stood. He adds to it some information that Moses didn't give us, that in the ark were the, the, the um, ten uh, stone tablets that were placed there um, by Moses that God directly wrote to Moses, but also Aaron's staff that budded. We talked about that a couple weeks ago when we talked about the gold lampstand. Again, you start to see the connection. God always connects things. He doesn't leave things kind of floating out there willy-nilly, but the connection between the Holy Spirit, that golden lampstand, again, in the Ark of the Covenant, and the bread, some manna, some manna from the wandering of uh, of the people of Israel in the desert. Manna is what God fed them. The manna was an interesting, uh, it, it was an interesting picture, probably connected to the person of Jesus. 
And so we have in there, in the Ark of the Covenant, really a representation of the Trinity as we know it. The writing of God, the laws of God, the justice of God in the Ten Commandments. Aaron's staff representing the Holy Spirit. The manna representing the Son. You have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You have the Trinity represented there in the, in the holy place, in, or the most holy place in the Ark of the Covenant. And only once a year was only the high priest allowed to enter in. Now think about that. One time a year, the people of God were able to enter into by, through one representative of all of the people, were able to enter into the presence of God. And if you read and study the way that happened, the incense was burned. They allowed the incense, the smoke of the incense to completely fill that room so that the priest never looked directly at the Ark of the Covenant. He would crawl underneath the incense or uh, smoke in order to, uh, to bring the offering before the Ark because the Ark of the Covenant was all about the presence of God. When we think about the presence of God, what's constantly brought before us in the Ark of the Covenant and in God himself is the holiness of God. Now, when we think of God, we often think about his love. We think about his goodness. We think about his provision. We think about his justice. We think about his, his, his power. We think about his presence everywhere. We have all of these images, these attributes of God. But when... When God um, gave his people the Ark of the Covenant, it was his holiness that really stood out. Remember, holy, to be holy, is to be set apart. And so throughout the Old Testament, what we see is this picture of God, this holy God who was set apart from his people. He was removed. And there was only rare instances and rare opportunity for people to enter into the greatness and majesty of God. We see why. If you move to the book of Exodus, uh, you read in Exodus chapter 33 uh, this story about Moses. And he's on the, on the mountain where he received the Ten Commandments, these stone tablets. And God is telling Moses, I have these things for you. And Moses is like, I, I don't know. I don't know if I can do this. He's again arguing with God. And God says, trust me. And Moses says, I want to see your glory. I want to see your glory so that I may know and understand your power so that I may know that you will follow through. And God's response was this. The Lord replied, I will make all my goodness pass before you. He tells Moses to kind of hide in the cleft of the rock on the mountain. And he says, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will call out my name, Yahweh, before you. For I will show mercy to anyone I choose. And I will show compassion to anyone I choose. But you may not look directly at my face, for no one may see me and live. You get a sense of the awe and majesty and power and greatness and authority and omnipotence of God. So great is his holiness, his need to be set apart. He says, nobody can look upon me. Nobody can see my face directly and live. As a matter of fact, as we read this story, we understand that as God does pass by Moses, and Moses just gets a the tiniest glimpse glimpse of the of the of the glory of God, of the back of God. Uh, we read that Moses comes down off of the mountain and he's his face shone with the glory of God. It's an incredible picture. But God very clearly says, nobody can look at my face and live. God understood that he is, God understands that he's too great, he's too majestic, he is too holy. And so he's very cautious with his people. And we understand that as we start to see the unfolding of this ark as it's created. 
We read in uh, the book of Numbers, we read about uh, once the ark has been created and, and, and it's in the tabernacle, and we start to read about some of these regulations and this, um, this uh, curtain, this veil that prevents people from seeing the ark, even the priest. Um, we ta- they, uh, Mo- uh, Moses reveals to us in Numbers the process of the ark moving as the people of God moved from camp- encampment to encampment. They, um, they would need people to move this. And so um, we read about the Kohathites, who are people who were given the responsibility of moving the tabernacle and its contents. And it, we're told in Numbers chapter 4, verse 20, that the Kohathites must never enter the sanctuary to look at the sacred objects for even a moment or they will die. And so we see that same phrase, those, that same wording from that, that God expressed to Moses on the mountain. Where God says, Moses, you cannot look at me or you will surely die. He says to the Kohathites, you shall not look at me or you will surely die. He's referring to his presence at the Ark of the Covenant. And so nobody was ever allowed to look directly at the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, everywhere it went, was covered with a covering so that people could not gaze upon it or they would surely die. Why? Because of the otherness, the holiness, the majesty of the living God. Now it's interesting that as uh, we read into uh, the story of the people of Israel, they, they conquer the promised land and, and they start to uh, set up a, a more, more permanent place for the ark to exist, for God's presence to exist. And they get in a, in a scuffle with the Philistines who steal the ark. They recognize that the presence of the ark of the covenant, the presence of God is the source of power for the people of Israel, so they steal it. And then later on in 2 Samuel, we read about David going to take back the ark. He needs to, in order to make his people successful in battle, in order to live, they know, David knows, he needs the presence of God with him. And so in 2 Samuel chapter 6, we read this. Then David again gathered all the elite troops in Israel, 30,000 in all. And he led them to Bala of Judah to bring back the ark of God, which bears the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, who is enthroned between the cherubim. Again, David is recognizing the presence of God in the ark of the covenant. And they place the ark of God on a new cart. See, the Philistines, they didn't know the regulations. They didn't know how the ark was to be transported. God said very clearly, only move this by carrying the ark by the poles. But the Philistines put it on, an ar- on a cart, an ox cart, and they just carried it that way. It's a whole lot easier to let the ox carry it than have people carry it. And so David and his people think, well, that's a good idea. So they make a new cart. They brought it from uh, Abinadab's house, which was on a hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, Abinadab's sons, were guiding the cart that carried the ark of God. And Ahio walked in front of the ark, and David and all the people of Israel were celebrating before the Lord, singing songs and playing all kinds of musical instruments, lyres and harps and tambourines, and castanets and cymbals. And verse 6 says, But when they arrived at the threshing floor of Nacon, the oxen stumbled, and Uzzah reached out his hand and steadied the ark of of God. Verse 7 says this, And then the Lord's anger was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him dead because of this. So Uzzah died right there beside the ark of God. You're like, well, that doesn't seem fair. I mean, you're just trying to be a good person. The ark's, you know, the ark stumbled a little bit. It might have fallen over. That would have been a terrible tragedy. So wasn't it good of Uzzah to reach up and steady it and kind of hold it in place? We understand that David and his people, as we read further, they come to a recollection of this. They 
mistreated. They treated haphazardly. They were singing, celebrating, and worshiping, but their understanding, their value of the presence and power of God was haphazard to them. And so as they were um, mistreating the presence of God, and the ox stumbled, and the ark is falling, when Uzzah, representatively of the people, reaches out carelessly and grabs hold of the ark, he struck dead. See, God was very serious about his, about his word to his people, saying, you shall not take my presence lightly. You shall understand the glory of my presence, the holiness of my presence, the separatedness of my presence. God took so seriously his presence in relation to his people. So much so that in the tabernacle between the holy place and the most holy place, he had them create a veil. And this veil was to, to guard his holiness, his separateness, his, uh, to guard the people from looking upon the Ark of the Covenant, from mistreating his glory that was represented there. And God took this so seriously. And he has them make this veil, and the veil uh, is described in Exodus 26. For inside the tabernacle, make a special curtain of finely woven linen and decorate it with blue, purple, and scarlet thread with skillfully embroidered cherubim. And hang this curtain on gold hooks attached to the four posts of acacia wood and overlay the posts with gold and set them in four silver basins and hang the inner curtains from clasps and put the Ark of the Covenant in the room behind it. This curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place. And so what we have is God understanding in the Ark of the Covenant we have His presence and He wants to, he wants to seal off His presence from, from people you know, taking it lightly or abusing it or even exposing themselves to it in an unworthy manner in causing their own death. And so he has, this, have that, has them make this curtain. Now as we understand the curtain, as we read about it, most of us think about curtains in our home. We think about, you know, these kind of sheer blinds or whatever it may be that we can kind of see through. But the curtain was actually incredibly heavy. And the same kind of material was used to cover the ark whenever it was moved so that nobody would look at it. I would encourage you when you think of the ark of the covenant and the veil to think more like this, more like a rug, a heavy, thick curtain that you cannot, um, that, that is not able to, um, to be seen through at all. It's completely solid. It is strong. There was no fear of somebody uh, ever getting uh, past it unintentionally, of seeing past it unintentionally. It was this incredible curtain. When the temple is built in Jerusalem, again, we have the same model of a holy place and a most holy place. And the Ark of the Covenant was placed there. But we read there between the holy place and the most holy place, as Tim read earlier, that when Jesus died, when Jesus paid the penalty for sin, what did he do? It says in verse um, 50 and 51 of Matthew 27, and then Jesus shouted again, and he released his spirit, and at that moment, the moment he died, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now we might think of a curtain as easy to tear, but that curtain was so strong and so uh, immovable by human beings, there was nothing people could have done to tear that. It's an incredible picture of God saying, through the person of Jesus, I am ripping this curtain apart. I am separating, I'm removing the barrier between me and my people. I am giving all people who would trust in me access to my presence, that they may know me, that they may worship me, that they may experience me in their lives. 
David understood the, the, the difficulty of entering into God's presence. In Psalm 23, he says, Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have a right relationship with their God and Savior. Such people may seek to worship in your presence, O God of Jacob. What we understand is that what Jesus did on the cross for us when he died Yes, He gave us forgiveness of sin. Yes, He washed us clean. Yes, He had purchased our eternity in heaven. But most significantly, what He did is He tore that curtain in the temple. He gave us access to a holy God. Why? Because we are now made pure. We are given the standing of, of Jesus Himself that we may enter into the presence of God. Hebrews 10 says it this way. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. And our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his presence, be, uh, keep his promises. Because of Jesus, we now have access to the very presence of God. Let the weight of that sink in. A presence that simply seeing God told Moses will kill you. A presence that the, the, that the Kohathites couldn't even gaze upon or they would die. A presence that when Uzzah reached up and touched the Ark of the Covenant, he was struck dead. Now we have the ability to not be struck dead, but to walk into the presence of holy God. That should it blow our minds and transform our lives. Unfortunately for so many of us, that concept has kind of fallen on deaf ears. We've forgotten that that holy God that's described in Scripture with justice and power and majesty and holiness still expects us to enter in with that same reverence and same humility and same surrender. Jesus has given us a gift. He has given us the ability to enter into the presence of God. And then he went one step further. He said, not only can you go into the presence of God, but when you receive me as your Savior, the presence of God will indwell you through the person of the Holy Spirit. Church, God has called us. He has freed us. He has invited us in with reverence, with humility, let us enter into and experience that kind of intimacy with Almighty God. What an incredible gift. It's only in understanding the presence of God in the Old Testament do we understand the weight and the power of being able to enter into His presence. And may we never, may we never, May we never take lightly or for granted that presence. The question is raises in our hearts is what does it mean to be known by and loved by this holy God and to know and love him in return? It's really the whole point of this series. 
It's what we've been talking about. It's why we enter into the, 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 a study of the tabernacle. It's why God gave us the picture of the tabernacle. It's why Hebrews tells us that this is a picture of worship in heaven because it is all about us as created beings having access to the one who created us. And so next week, we're going to dive into this whole idea of being known by and loved by this God and knowing and loving him in return. I'm so glad you've chosen to worship with us today. My prayer, my hope of our time together is that God would have drawn us to this place, this understanding of his glory and his greatness, and that in return, that we would be, would be filled with awe at his majesty. And that we would enter with boldness into his presence, but doing so with this incredible understanding of who he is in his great power. Let's pray together. Father, thank you, for, thank you for the Ark of the Covenant. And God, we often think of it as this old thing that relates to this um, uh, time long ago, people long ago. But God, it really is an incredible picture of your presence, of your work, of your majesty, and your willingness as the King of kings and Lord of lords to invite us into your presence. We love you. We worship you. We adore you. In Jesus' name. We're going to sing about our holy God. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
want to thank you for worshiping with us. Let's close our time together with prayer. Father, thank you for thank you for being willing to allow us into your presence. We recognize that we are not worthy in and of ourselves, but because we've been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus, we've been washed by the blood, we as sinful people, forgiven, can enter into the presence of holy, holy, holy God. We thank you, we praise you, we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you next week.